as I saw the last blue line of my native land fade away like a cloud on the horizon. It seemed as if I had closed one volume of the world and its concerns and had time for meditation before I opened another. That land, too, now vanishing from my view, which contained all that was most dear to me in life. What vicissitudes might occur in it? What changes might ch take place in me before I should visit it again? Who can tell when he sets forth to wander, whether he may be driven by the uncertain currents of existence, or when he may return? or whether it may ever be his lot to revisit the scenes of the childhood. Such were the dubious thoughts that had passed like a shade across my mind many years since, as I lost sight of my native land on my voyage to Europe. Yet, I had every reason for bright anticipations. I was buoyant with health, had enough of the quote-unquote world's gear, for all my wants was on my way to visit my, the fairest scenes in Europe, with the prospect of returning home in a few years. Stored with recollections for the remainder of my life. The boating Doubts, however, which had beclouded my mind at the moment of departure, threatened to prove, to prove prophetic. Years and years elapsed, yet I remained a voluntary exile from my home. Why did I make it so? The question has often been asked, for once I will make a brief reply. It was my lot, almost on landing in Europe, to experience a reverse of fortune which cast me down in spirit and altered the whole tenor of my life. In the midst of perplexities and humiliations, I turned on my pen for solace and support. I had hitherto exercised it for amusement. I now looked to it as my main dependence, resolving, if successful, never to abandon it for any prospect of worldly gain, nor to return to my friends until by my literary exertions I placed myself above their pity or assistance. Such are the main reasons that unexpectedly beguiled me into a long protracted absence. How and why that absence was thus protracted would involve a story of baffled plans and deferred hopes which led me on from month to month and year to year, and left me where they found me, would involve, in short, the checkered story of my humble con concerns of precarious feelings, and I have shrinking repugnance to such an exposure. Suffice to say, that was my path, which many are apt to think was a flowery one, was often, too often beset by thorns, and that at times, when I was supposed beguiled by my pleasures and splendors of Europe, and, quote, treading the primrose path of dalliance, quote, unquote, I was in fact shut up from society, battling with cares and perplexities, almost struggling for subsistence. In the meantime, my lengthened exile subjected me to painful doubts and surmises. Some who really valued me supposed that I was dazzled by the factitious splendors around me. And was leading a life of Epicurean indulgence. Others who knew me not or chose to judge harshly accused me of a want of affection for my native land. I met with imputations of the kind in public papers and I received anonymous letters reiterating them and basically endeavoring to persuade me that I had lost the goodwill of my countrymen. I should have treated these imputations with little regard, but they reached me in desponding moments when other circumstances had pro produced a morbid state of feelings and they sunk deeply in my mind.
the literary undertakings in which I was engaged on, and on which I depended for my maintenance required a further absence from my country, yet I found that absence attributed to motives abhorrent to my feelings and wounding to my pride. By degrees, I was led to doubt the entire sentiment of my countrymen towards me. Perhaps I was rendered more sensitive on the head, this head of, by the indulgent good will I had ever experienced from them. They had always cherished me beyond my deserts, my deserts, excusing my many deficiencies, taking my humors and errors in good part, and exaggerating every merit. Their cordial kindness had in me an, a matter become necessary to me. I was like a spoiled child that could not bear the glance of an altered eye. I care even less for their good opinion than their good will, and felt indignant at being elbowed into a position with respect to them from which my soul revolted. I was repeatedly urged by those who knew the workings of, the, of my feelings to lay them before my countrymen and to repel the doubts that had been cast upon my patriotism. I declined to follow their advice. I had generally been con content in all matters relating to myself to suffer the truth to work its own way to light. To light. If the conduct and concerts concerns of an individual are worthy of public, public attention, they will soon or sooner or later be accurately known and appreciated. And it is that ultimate opinion that alone constitutes true reputation. All transient popularity is little worth struggling for. Beside, what was I asked to vindicate myself from? A want of affection to my native country? I should ask as soon as think of vindicating myself from the charge of a want of love to, my, to, the, to the mother that bore me. I could not reply to such an imputation. My heart would swell in my throat and keep me silent. Yet I will confess that the error which had been planted in my heart rankled and festered there. The corroding doubt that had been infused in my waking thoughts affected my sleeping fancies. The return to my country, so long anticipated, became the constant subject of harassing dreams. I would fancy myself arrived in my native city, but the place would be so changed that I could not recognize it. I would wander through strange streets, meet with strange faces, and find every strange thing around me. Or what was worse, I would meet with those I loved, with my kindred, and the companions of my youth, but they no longer knew me, or passed me by with neglect. I cannot tell how often I have wakened from such jury dreams and felt a sadness at heart for hours afterwards. At length, the long anticipated moment arrived. I again saw the quote, blue line of my native land, unquote, rising like a cloud in that horizon where so many years before I had seen it fade away. I again saw the bright city of my birth rising out of its beautiful bay, its multiplied fans, fanes and spires, and its prolonged forest of masts. Claiming its augmented grandeur, my heart throbbed with pride and admiration as I gazed upon it. I gloried in being its son. But how was the wanderer to be received after such an absence? Was he to be taken as a favored child to its bosom, or repulsed as a stranger and its changeling? My old doubts recurred as I stepped upon land. I could scarcely realize that I was indeed in my native city, among the haunts of my childhood. Might not this be another of those dreams that had so often beguiled me? There were circumstances enough to warrant me such a surmise. I passed through places that ought to be familiar to me, but were all changed. Huge edifices and lofty piles had sprung up in the place of lowly tenements. Old landmarks of the city were gone. The very streets were altered. 
As I passed on, I looked wistfully in every face. Not one was known to me. Not one! Yet I was in Haunton where every visity visage was once familiar to me. I read the names on of every, every door, all were new. They were unassociated with any early recollection. The saddening conviction stole over my heart that I was a stranger in my own home. Alas, thought I, what was what had I to expect after such an absence? Let not the reader be mistaken. I have no doleful picture to draw, no sorrowful demand to make upon his sympathies. It has been the lot of many a wanderer, returning as our shorter lapse of years, to find the scenes of his youth gone and to ruin and to, to decay. If I had anything to deplore, it was the improvement of my home. It had outgrown my recollection from its every prosperity, and strangers had crowded into it from every clime, to participate in its overflowing abundance. A little while was sufficient to reconcile me to a change, the result of prosperity. My friends, too, all once clustered in neighboring continu continuity, contiguity, in a moderate community, now scattered widely asunder over a splendid metropolis. Soon gathered together to welcome me, and never did wander after such an absence, experience such a greeting. Then it was that every doubt vanished from my mind. Then it was that I felt I was indeed at home, and that it was a home with a heart. I thanked my stars that I had been born among such friends. I thanked my stars that I had conducted me back to dwell among them while I had yet the capacity to enjoy their fellowship. It is the very reception I had met with that has drawn me from these confessions. Had I experienced coldness or distrust, had I been treated as an alien or from the sympathies of my countrymen, I should have been buried my wounded feelings in my bosom and remained silent. But they have welcomed me home with their old indulgence. They have shown that notwithstanding my, their, my long absence and the doubts suggesting suggestions to which it has given rise, they still believe and trust in me. And now let them feel assured that I am heart and soul among them. I make no boast of my patriotism. I, I can always say that as far as it goes, it is no blind attachment. I have sojourned in various countries and have been treated in them as among my desserts, above my desserts, and the remembrance of them is grateful and pleasant to me. I have seen what is brightly and best in foreign lands and have found in every nation enough to labor and honor, yet with all these recollections living in my imagination and kindling in my heart, I look around with delightful exultation upon my native land. And feel that off there on my ramblings above the world, I can ha be happiest at home. And now a word too with respect to the volume here presented to the reader, or in this case, the listener. Having, since my return to the United States, made a wide and varied tour for the gratification of my curiosity, it has been supposed that I did for the the purpose of writing a book, and has more than once been intimidated in the papers. That such a work was actually in the press, containing scenes and sketches of the Far West. These announcements, gratuitously made for me, before I had put pen to paper, or even con contemplated anything of the kind, have embarrassed me exceedingly. I have been like a poor actor who finds himself announced for a part he has no thought of playing and his appearance expected on the stage before he has committed a line to memory. I've always had a repugnance amounting to, almost to disability to write in the face of expectation, 
And in the present instance, I was expected to write about a region fruitful of wonders and adventures, and which had already been made the spirit of theme of spirit stirring narratives from able pens, yet about which I had nothing wonderful or adventurous to offer. Since such, however, seems to be the desire of the public, and that they take sufficient interest in my wanderings to deem them worthy for recital, I have hastened as promptly as possible to meet in some degree the expectation from which others have excited. For this purpose I have, as it were, plucked a few of the leaves out of my memorandum book, containing a month's foray beyond the outposts of human habitation. into the, well, the wilderness of the far west. It forms indeed but a small portion of the extensive tour, but it is an episode, complete as far as, as it goes. As such, I offer to the public with great difference, diffidence, it is a a simple narrative of everyday occurrences, such as, such as happen to everyone who travels the prairies. I have no wonders to describe, nor any moving accidents by flood or vehicle to narrate. And to those who look for a marvelous or adventurous story in my hands, I can only reply in the words of the weary knife grinder, Story? Oh, God bless you, I have none to tell.